Amen. Well, praise the Lord. My name is Marcus Barr, and uh, I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter 9, uh, starting at verse 1. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinance of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the mat, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables, the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubims of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot, not, we cannot know, we cannot now speak in detail. Now when these things have been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. But into the second part, the highest priest went along, along the highest priest went along once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sin committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicated this, that the, that the way in the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who, who perform the services perfect, but the, perform the service perfect in regard to the uh, conscience. Concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances imposed into the time of uh, reformation. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifers, sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God? Cleanse your conscience, for dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who call may, those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is te a, for where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testament. Testament. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it is since it has no power at all while the testament lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dictated without blood. Dedicated, I'm sorry. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Therefore, we, therefore it was necessary that the copies of the, of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of, of God for, uh, for us, not that he should offer himself, himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of, of, of another, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of ages, of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. 
and that is it is appointed for men to die once, but after this judge, after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of men to die once. The sin to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, we will appear a second time. He will appear a second time. Apart from sin for salvation. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, welcome everyone to Hebrews. Uh, we're going through chapter 9 now, and let's get right into the word here. Point number one is understanding the Old Testament temple. Uh, the Bible says that indeed even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary, for a tabernacle was prepared in the first, in the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. Everyone say the sanctuary. 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 And behind the second veil, uh, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all. Say the holiest of all. The holiest of all. Which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which was the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail, but I do want to call your attention to this uh, little graphic here about how the temple was laid out. So if you look from your left to your right, you see it's got dimensions there, you know, 75 foot by 150 feet. Uh, and then also, what do you see? You see a gate there. The first thing that you see in the courtyard was the brazen altar. And then you see also a, a laver or laver, which was filled with water. So on the brazen, brazen altar was sacrifices burnt up to God. They put the animals on there and Burn them up as a sacrifice to God for sin and for praise and for worship to God. And then the priests would wash themselves in the, the labor there, you know, the water. And that, that represents the word of God. And then also, you look, there's another thing called the holy place. And in the holy place, there's inside this place was the table of showbread, the candles, and uh, there was an altar of incense there. And then you see that little divider, that squiggly little line there. That represents this big, thick curtain and that separated the uh, the holy place from the holy of holies and inside that holy of holies was the ark of the covenant you see and that's where the priest went in once a year and took the blood for atonement and put it down there to cleanse the nation's sins of Israel okay and so let's go on here though and I, I put this graph together I found a really nice uh, source this um, chart right here that we have here and uh, it compares the Ark of the Covenant, the Mercy Seat with uh, the Old Testament meaning and the New Testament. So to the left it's the Old Testament. It means a symbol of God's law. The Ark was made of wood covered with gold. The Ark was the throne of God where his glory rests on the Mercy Seat uh, top and that's a symbol of his mercy. The sacrificed blood was sprinkled on the Ark to cover the sins of the people. Now in the New Testament the phrase mercy seat also means propitiation. Jesus is the propitiation for us today. And so his blood was shed to cleanse our sins. We come to God through him and offer our spiritual sacrifices. So the mercy seat. And then the, there's the inner veil. And that hung between the holy place and the holy of holies. And only the high priest could go there once a year. But now Hebrews 10, 19 through 20 teaches that the veil represents Christ's body which was given for us at the cross. And see, remember what Jesus said on the cross? He said, he said many things. Yeah, he said, it is finished. And when he died, what does the Bible say happened to that veil? It was torn. Was it torn from top to bottom or bottom to top? Top to bottom. The Bible says, think about that. So this was no man-made deal tearing it from the bottom to the top. They didn't get up on a on a Sears ladder up there and either and tear it down from the top to the bottom. You couldn't tear this thing. I mean, it was like huge, thick, you know. No, God reached down by his mighty hands and ripped that veil apart, praise God. And said, I'm not in here anymore, praise God. I'm out and about, praise the Lord. And you, you, don't, you don't approach me this way anymore, praise the Lord. You see, it's done. It's over through Jesus' body. And then the altar of incense was continually burned at this uh, altar incense, that is, uh, that stood before the veil separating the holy place and the holy of holies. The high priest was to make atonement uh, on its horns once a year before entering the holy of holies. Now, the altar of incense also was a symbol of prayer. 
Christians are to be continually in prayer, offering up prayer and, and offering up your body, the Bible says, as a living sacrifice. Amen. So how about the table of showbread? Well, it was a symbol of God's providence or provision. The table had 12 loaves of bread that were a reminder that the tribes were constantly in the presence of God and that God saw all that they did. The bread also reminds the people that God fed his people. Can I hear it? Amen. 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 You see, so God, the showbread there represents God's presence. And for us in the New Testament, it means the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Where do you get the greatest revelation from the word of God at? In the presence of God. So when you're eating the bread, the word, and reading it, studying it, the Holy Spirit opens your eyes and brings life and strength to you. I'll tell you what, I love homemade fresh bread. My mom used to make homemade fresh bread. The smell of that bread would just reek throughout the whole house, and I'd make me hungry. And I would just say, is it ready? Can I have some? I like, want it now. You see? And so as soon as it came out, as soon as I could rip that loaf of bread apart and put some butter on it, Nick was chowing down on fresh hot bread. And you know, God has fresh hot bread for his people. If you're called to preach and teach the word of God, you need to be in the presence of God. Because why? He will anoint you with fresh revelation to preach the word to feed the people of God and it won't be stale bread. There's nothing worse than ordering a sandwich somewhere and then you go to bite into it. Man, it just tastes bad. It's just crunchy. You know it's old bread. You know, God wants us preachers to preach the word in such a way that when people eat, eat of the message that we're giving, they get fed and they want more. Can I hear an amen? amen. I mean, good food makes you hungry more. I mean, there's, there's, there's only three words I say to people at a restaurant if I really like the food. I'm coming back. Okay? Yeah. You see, and so when I went to Sate House the other day with my beautiful wife back there, Ingrid, and we ate some nice quick yow, and we ate some other Asian food in there, and some fried Hokkien meat, I told the lady, I said, we're coming back. Praise the Lord. And we've been back about 20 times, not 20 yet, but several times. And I'm telling you what, 13 Mile Road and Dequender, north uh, west corner, Sante House. Go try it out. Tell them Pastor Nick sent you. Amen. And so, I mean, good food makes you hungry, man. It makes you want to, want to go back for more. And if you're called to preach, you need to be in the presence of God, hearing from God, getting a prophetic anointing, praise the Lord, that builds people, that feeds them, that edifies them. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so the uh, table of showbread is, is the word of God. Now the golden lampstand, symbolizing light from God, the intricately patterned lampstand was to give light continually, fueled by clear olive oil. So it was representing light. Now what does it mean for us in the New Testament? Well, Revelation chapter 1, 12 through 20 indicates that the local churches are represented by golden lampstands. What's that mean? That the churches are supposed to be bright lights in their community. Amen. See, pointing people to Jesus Christ, the light of the world. We're to be the light of the world, see? And how do we get light in God's presence? The Bible says God is light. So when you're in the presence of God, he, that, that light's going to reflect on you. Amen. And when you come out of the presence of God, whoo, glory. You might be glowing like Moses, praise the Lord. You're standing in line at Myers. I'm going to use Myers. I always use Walmart all the time. But, I just, you know, when you're in Myers, man, people just look at you. Whoo, I'm like, man, 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 what are you so happy? What are you so happy about? What's that, what's that glow on your face? Oh, Jesus Christ, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and then that bronze altar. That bronze altar stood at the uh, courtyard of the tabernacle. This is where the animals were sacrificed to cover the sins of the Israelite people. Jesus' death on the cross was the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. He is pictured in all the sacrifices God commanded Israel to bring. Uh, and so Jesus fulfilled all those types when he died on the cross for our sins. And point number two is the Old Testament temple was symbolic of the temple in heaven. So I'm not going to read all those scriptures right there, but the point is this, is that the temple that God had us build, and Solomon built, Moses built, David built, the tabernacles, the tents, all those were, were symbolic of what God has in heaven. So it was, a, it was a communication tool. It was there to get people and mankind ready to understand what God's really after, you see. God doesn't want us on the outside. God wants us on the inside of him, praise the Lord. But he communicated through the temple, you see, that there's a problem. 
Houston, we have a problem. Okay, the problem is sin. Everyone say sin. sin. That's the problem. That's what separates people from God. But God did something about the problem. Can I hear it? Amen. Amen. He sent Jesus Christ, excuse me, <coughs> and when he, when he died on that cross, took away our sins. And this was, like you see the highlight there at verse 9, it was symbolic. And I also put a, a highlight, a bold, it said, until the time of Reformation. So God's plan was never for the Old Testament temple to remain, you know, throughout eternity. It was only to point people to the realities of what God's really after, and that's a relationship with them through the blood of Jesus. And when Jesus died on the cross, he said it's finished, that, that, that uh, veil was ripped. You see, he was teaching us by the temple that, see, you no longer approach me that way. Thank God we don't have to get on to 787 or 747 and fly to Jerusalem and get in line and bring our offering and, you know, and try to approach God through a physical temple. We don't do it that way anymore. Can I hear amen? amen. You see, and in, in heaven, the glory that was wrapped up behind that, that, that veil of the Holy of Holies in that little place in space and time, you see, where the high priest went into once a year. Well, Jesus has opened the way for every Christian and believer throughout all eternity to experience the holy of holy presence of God. And the good news is you get to enter into it right now spiritually. Praise God. You see, and that's a reality. So point number three is Jesus Christ, our high priest, obtained eternal redemption for us. I'm going to read this verse. Verse 11 says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. The King James says, for us. I like King James better. Having obtained eternal redemption for us through the blood, you see. And so we are eternally saved through the blood of Jesus Christ, the Bible says. Amen. You see, now point number four is redemption uh, through the blood of Jesus Christ. And it says that the uh, the bulls and the goats and the ashes that the priests used to use, they would sprinkle the unclean and it sanctified people for the purifying of the flesh. But the Bible says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So what does this teach us? This teaches us that we can't cleanse ourselves by any act of righteousness that we try to perform to please God. Amen. It's only through the blood of Jesus Amen. Christ Thank that Jesus. we are accepted and cleansed and made righteous in God's sight, praise the Lord. Amen. So when you're really saved, it's deeper than just trying to turn a leaf, change your ways, reform your ways, live a better life. No, it is a cleansing of the conscience, praise the Lord. I'll never forget when I was saved in 1982, when I prayed that little prayer and called out to Jesus with all my heart. I woke up the next day, and I felt the weight of my sins gone. I felt his peace enter on the inside of me. Amen. You see, and so that's what happens through the blood of Jesus, and nothing else that you can perform, do, act, it doesn't matter how high you jump, or what hoops you try to go through, what, what righteous acts you try to perform, you can't earn God's salvation that way. It's only through repentance and faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, what he's already done for us. Amen. And that cleanses your conscience from dead works and to serve the living God. So that then you're, you're free to serve and live and worship God and enter his presence through the blood of Jesus Christ because you've been cleansed. You see, now where the devil tries to attack us as Christians is he keeps trying to tell us you're not saved. He keeps trying to tell you you're not good enough. And the truth is, you're not good enough. But the truth is, the blood of Jesus, if you're born again, you're saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. You see, and so you have to take a hold of these. Listen, you're either saved or you're not saved. Amen. You're either going north or south when you die. You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. You know, Jesus Christ died on the cross to save all of us, and I'm, I'm saved. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you see, and I can't do anything to earn it, but I've received it. I've received his salvation. Amen. So now, uh, point five is Jesus' death established the new covenant. It says, for this reason, he's the mediator of the new covenant.
covenant that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, uh, that those who are called, how many are called? Somebody tell me. Everybody's called. May receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is enforced after men are dead, since it is, has no power at all while the testator lives. In other words, the new covenant that Jesus Christ said that he was going to initiate, remember when he broke the bread and he passed out the, the juice or the wine to the disciples that take, eat, drink, this is my body, which is broken for you, this is my blood, which is poured out for you. Well, he was initiating about what they were about ready to enter into after his death, you see. But when he, it wasn't in fact, it wasn't in effect, it was only a promise. But when he said it's finished on the cross, yeah. and he poured out his blood, yeah. Amen. You see, then when he died, what he said is now ours by faith, you see, Amen. because he paid the price, and now we can enter into it. Preach that message, Amen. teach that message, set humanity free that Jesus Christ has already paid for all of our sins, praise the Lord. But we have to individually, by faith, make a decision and enter it and receive it by faith that it's ours. And say, yes, Lord, I want to be saved, you see. So good ministers of the gospel will set people free. Amen. And you see, through the blood of Jesus Christ, will bring them into a relationship with God. False ministers will put bondage on people and tell them that they got to do this, that, and the other. You know, to be saved. No, it's repentance and faith. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. And remember, remember the thought? Trust and obey. Oh, no, I can't even, I can't even strike up the cord. <laughs> Trust and obey, for there's no other way. To be happy in Jesus. But you trust him. See, I don't have the gift of singing, but you know, I will strike a strike up a melody if you want. You know, make a make a joyful noise. So I'm happy that I'm saved, you see. And so Jesus died, therefore the new covenant is now established. Point number six. Both old and new covenants were established through blood. Everyone say through blood. Through the blood. Uh, through the blood. <laughs> Yeah, now, this is very important, through the blood. Now, notice in bold what I have. What does it say? say let's read it together in bold. It says, without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Very important here. The old covenant was established through a blood covenant sacrifice. Okay, the new covenant with, with us. The relationship that we have with God is established through the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, now, false religions and cults deny the need of the blood of Jesus for salvation. Yeah, God. Any group that doesn't That's preach right. the blood yes, of Jesus yes. Christ is a false cult and satanic. Right I'm That's just telling you, I don't care That's how it. good they look, how smooth they are, how many good works they do for humanity, they are satanic. Okay, because if it's a religion representing God and the way to God without preaching the blood of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, they're from the devil. Okay, I'm just going to call a spade a spade. All right, now you're saying, Pastor, man, you really get upset. It's real. Yes, I am. Praise the Lord. Because I'm not going to put up with, with any kind of a group that says that they represent the true and living God of the creation of the universe that doesn't preach the blood of Jesus Christ as the way of salvation, okay? And I thank God in our church we do, amen. amen. We preach that you've got to be saved for confessing Jesus Christ as Lord, believing that he's, he died and rose again, and that represents the blood, his death and resurrection, amen. You see, now, the way of Cain was self-works instead of faith in God's ordained blood sacrifice. They all realize that? Do you realize that Jude, verse 11, says, Woe to them, speaking of false ministers, says, For they have gone in the way of Cain. They've gone in the way of Cain. See, when you hear about Cain, what do you think of? Backslider. You know? but, but also, what do you think about with Cain? Well, when you compare Abel and Cain, what did Abel offer, offer up to God? A blood sacrifice. And it was accepted, the Bible says. What did Cain offer up to God? The fruit of the garden. Out back, man, he had his garden. Maybe it was some melon. Papaya. You know, maybe whatever it was, he offered it up, but God wasn't pleased. It might have tasted good. It might have looked good. But God never told Cain, you can approach me by offering up the fruit of your garden and your toil and work to be accepted of me. No, it was rejected. See, and Cain was upset that God did not accept his offering, the Bible says. 
you see. And, and, and so many today in the last days are going, listen, in the way of Cain, okay? They're, tra they're tra I could name several cults and false Christian groups around town that don't preach the need to repent and be saved and believe on the blood of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, okay? And so they've gone in the way of Cain. Beware of that. Always preach the blood of Jesus. Always teach the need to be cleansed of your sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus said, I give you a new covenant in my blood, not my fruit garden now back. You, know, not, you don't have a new covenant through being a good enough person, you see. You have a new covenant by mercy, grace, and the blood of Jesus Christ. Set people free by preaching that message and get them born again and saved. Okay? Point number seven is that Jesus represents us to the Father in heaven. This is exciting. Verse 23 says, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Amen. Yes. Not against us. No, for us. Christ has entered into the presence of God for us. He's there for us. You've got somebody in your corner in heaven. You've got somebody there working on your side in heaven. You've got somebody speaking to the Father in heaven for you. Praise the Lord. Jesus is for you, not against you. The next verse says, uh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, My little children, these things I write unto you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours, but the, for the sins of the whole world, praise God. You see, and so Jesus is there right now. So what do you do when you have a bad day, and you eat some stupid pills, and you sin, and do something you shouldn't do as a Christian? Anybody, anybody, if you, he that is without sin, let him raise his hand. No takers, you see. You see, and so the thing is, is you, you don't run from God. You remember Jesus is there for you. I mean, God saw everything you did. He saw the motive. He saw everything you did. You see, and Jesus is just waiting there, and so is the Father, with outstretched arms, saying, "Come, come back. Why did you do that for? I love you. I forgive you. Just confess those sins. Repent." Uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, so that's what we do in the presence of God. And then it, I imagine it works like this. Jesus says, Father, Nick is repenting. Father, see the blood on the mercy seat that I shed 2,000 years ago. I'm going to apply a little of that over Nick right now. I paid for all those sins. Just forgive me, cleanse him. And the Father says, yeah, that's a great idea. I think I'll do that. Come on back to the fellowship, my son. Yeah, see, so that's that's the heart of God. Amen. We complicate things and think we got to fast 40 days before we'll be accepted by God again. We have to somehow beat ourselves up before we'll be accepted of God again. You know what? That's really dumb. That's the way of Cain. That's trying to trying to please God by your self-effort to be accepted by Him again. When you were saved by grace and not your own works, the Bible says, and when you backslide, you fall, you're, you come back to the Father the same way, by mercy, faith, repentance, and grace. Can I hear it? Amen. Amen. And God's love is always the same. Amen. And so uh, now, uh, point number eight, Jesus suffered on the cross once for all men. Now, uh, verse 25 says, not that he should suffer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. Then he would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So Jesus already did it. We've already covered that. He did it once for all men. Point number nine, three phases. Everyone say it together. Death, judgment, and salvation. Okay. Death, judgment, and salvation. Verse 27 says, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of men. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. 
In other words, he, he came nearly 2,000 years ago and died on the cross for salvation. And, we, and those of us who enter into that by faith enter into salvation. But when he's coming back again, praise God, he's coming to consummate what he began, praise the Lord. Yeah. And he's going to come in power and great glory. Those of us who are alive, when the Lord comes, are going up to meet him in the air, praise the Lord. Suddenly, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, I mean... He's going to come and we're going to be changed, the Bible says, and meet him in the air, praise the Lord. So that's why I just say live ready, amen. Live ready, live like you're going to meet him today, but work and minister and plan and do your ministry like it might be 30 years, praise the Lord. Because you don't know, but you have to commit to serve the Lord for the rest of your life. Can I hear an amen? amen. You see, because the Bible says there's, there's death, it's appointed unto man once to die. What does that, what does that do? Uh, to us in our minds uh, when it comes to the thought of reincarnation through Hinduism. It defeats that. It blows it out of the water. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, it, see, reincarnation and Christianity are incompatible. You see, because the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, not go through a cycle of rebirth into being a cat, a dog, Uncle Joe, Aunt Sally, you know, I'm not coming back as anybody else. No. When, when God created Nick Bork, he sent me into the world and broke the mold in heaven, praise God. Amen. Amen. And you too were all uniquely created in the image of God, as children of God, and there's not gonna, there's no other person like you, you see, or me. And so we have one life to live, and we live it for God here and now like money. We invest it into the kingdom of God, our lives, and we spend our lives, our time, our energy for the Lord and his, div his divine purpose, which is salvation, you see. And so it's appointed unto me once to die. After that, the judgment. But thank God, my sins, your sins, have already been judged Jesus. on the cross. Amen. 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 And so when we go into the presence of God, we're not going to wonder, <laughs> I wonder if I'm saved or not. I wonder if my sins, I wonder if I've been fully forgiven. Get, you know, get that settled. I hope there's, that's one thing you get settled with the book of Hebrews, is that you're already saved through Jesus Christ and his blood. You see, so you're not trying to get saved anymore. You're already saved. And so Jesus is coming again. And so that's, thank you for watching Hebrews chapter 9. Next week we'll be Hebrews chapter 10. Can you believe we're going to cover the whole book of Hebrews? Amen. And we're going to be world changers and world overcomers in Jesus' name. Praise God. Because nothing is impossible with God.